All right, let's start the next set of flip notes. This is the uh, first set of earthquake notes, flip notes number 29. So have your PowerPoint in front of you, have something with which to write, and let's get started. Definition of an earthquake is the vibration of the solid earth, and it's produced by a very rapid release of energy. It's important to remember that the energy that drives all the earthquakes is derived from the earth's interior generally from heat trying to escape and that heat ultimately uh, causing the tectonic plates uh, to move and shift. Right. Sometimes you can have earthquakes that aren't related to tectonics just by settling or magmatic or something like that but it is more often than not the tectonic plates that are responsible for this rapid release of energy. It's important to understand and study earthquakes. There's many reasons for that. First of all, good to know how our planet operates. Pure scientific curiosity. Second, if we could get to a point where we could actually predict earthquakes, that would be um, a major advancement to uh, saving lives and being able to prevent disasters. Third, earthquakes are the main way that we're able to view the interior of the earth. As the waves propagate through the different layers of the earth, we can listen to those waves, we can uh, image those waves, and get a better understanding of how the layers are differentiated below us. Um, much in the same way that a sonogram is used to look at an unborn baby in the mother's womb with sound waves, Earthquake waves can produce images of the layers below our feet. And all that together when we're studying earthquakes, hopefully we'll get to a point sometime in the near future where we can really avoid tragedies um, like the one shown here. This is a photograph of Mexico City from an earthquake that happened in 1985 when an 8.0 magnitude earthquake struck uh, near the capital city. Estimated 25, 30,000 people were killed um, when thousands of buildings crumbled due to the shaking. Where in the world are they? Well, we certainly hit on this before when we were studying the plate tectonics unit, but the majority of the earthquakes that occur on our planet are associated with tectonic boundaries. You have the mid ocean ridge here in the Atlantic. You have the <clears throat> plate contact of the Nazca and the South American. You have the East Pacific rise. You have the ring of fire here with the Aleutians, the Philippines, Indonesia, around New Zealand, San Andreas, Cocos subducting underneath North America. Most of the earthquakes are along these plate boundaries, and we know that couple of terms here, the focus and the epicenter. The focus is the point of origin. It's where the energy is focused. It's where it radiates out from. Most earthquakes do not occur directly on the surface. It's important to remember that earthquakes are not always on the surface, but usually at depth. You need to know that the entire tectonic boundary doesn't rip at once. These plates move along and shift along like a caterpillar or like an inchworm moving sections at a time. One time there'll be a section that moves from an earthquake and then 20 years later another section will move and then 20, 30 years later another section will move and it creeps along uh, as different sections move forward. The epicenter is what we more commonly hear about than the focus. But the epicenter, remember what epi means, epi means above or on top like epidermis is their top layer of skin. The epicenter is the layer, excuse me, the point on the surface directly above the focus. Now, some earthquakes do occur on the surface, but most of them occur somewhere at depth. In the epicenter, you simply um, go directly to the surface above where the focus occurs. So differentiate between the focus, which is where the earthquake actually happens, and the epicenter is epi, the point on the surface above the focus. How deep can earthquakes get? Well, we talked about this <clears throat> with plate tectonics. It's worth reviewing. 
As I said earlier, it is possible. Earthquakes can occur on the surface, but most, most generally occur at depth. The depth that they occur generally is going to be a function of the type of plate boundary. Convergent boundaries produce the largest and most destructive earthquakes, and they can also produce the deepest ones because of subduction. Because of subduction going here, you can get those deep earthquakes. Transform boundaries. Quakes, these can be large, but generally they're going to be shallow, from the surface down to about 80 kilometers, about 50 miles down. And then lastly, divergent plate boundaries are going to produce weaker, shallower quakes within the upper um, 30 to 40 kilometers, because that's where the plates are the thinnest. And when we start talking about earthquake theory and how to understand them, and think about throwing a pebble into um, a pond or a lake, and the waves radiate out in all directions. At least they do in two dimensions. <clears throat> Earthquakes are very similar. When that energy is released, earthquake waves, seismic waves as they're called, is going to radiate out, going to propagate out in all directions. Not just in two dimensions on the surface, but they will propagate out in all three dimensions. Up, down, back, forth, left, right. So instead of concentric circles on a pond, what shape would they form as they radiate out? It would be concentric spheres as these radiate out. All right? Now, rock does a very good job of absorbing uh, seismic energy. So if you're several hundred miles away from an earthquake, you're not going to have significant damage. But if you're very close and it's a large event, you could potentially have significant damage. Right. Whose fault is it? <laughs> fault. Oh, jeez. Most earthquakes occur along faults or fault zones. Again, some earthquakes can occur as magma is pushing up through cracks and causing vibrations. But we can have what's called strike-slip faults. We talked about that. You can have normal fault where the hanging wall goes down relative to the foot wall. You can also have uh, reverse faults, sometimes called thrust faults, as we mentioned, where the hanging wall goes up relative to the foot wall. Now, some faults are uh, just a few kilometers in length. Other faults are thousands of kilometers long, like the San Andreas. The entire contact of the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate is a giant transform that is strike-slip fault. So fault is a place where the Earth cracks and then there is movement. Understanding the theory. No one really knew um, how earthquakes operated until after the 1906 Great San Francisco Earthquake the early 20th century. Even before that, people were thinking earthquakes were caused by underground explosions, just crazy ideas. A fellow by the name of H.F. Reed uh, studied the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and um, other scientists as well, and ultimately he realized that the earth was moving, was building up stress, and then was releasing that stress violently. And he went to several locations, uh, including a place like this. And this fence used to be straight. And then after the San Francisco earthquake, it shifted. And they had to add in these to make sure their livestock didn't get out. And he realized that the San Andreas fault cut right through here and you had movement that was building up pressure and then ultimately rupturing during the quake itself. And there was quite a bit of movement during the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. 12 feet in some places, 15, 16 feet in other places. And they realized <clears throat> that as the Pacific plate's moving north relative to the North American plate, you would have a fence. And then right before the earthquake, pressure pushes finally gives way and then ultimately it ruptures and we call that elastic rebound. 
just like a rubber band being stretched and then snapping back. The plates, the hard rigid rock, you build up pressure, it wants to push, wants to push, and then ultimately it ruptures and gives way, just like that rubber band snapping back into location. That is elastic rebound. And you can have this elastic rebound regardless of whether you have tensional stress, remember that's pulling apart, whether you have compressional stress, remember that's pushing together, or whether you have shear stress, it's going side to side. Solid materials can build up this um, stress regardless of what the motion is like. So the stress is the buildup of pressure, and then ultimately the strain is the resulting deformation. So stress causes strain. And the amount of weight on the plates in the crust, the, the rocks in the crust are under incredible amounts of pressure. And they will slowly deform as the forces beneath them drive their motion. And once the rock's strength is exceeded, once it can't hold on any longer, they're going to rupture. And when they rupture, they'll cause vibrations. And those vibrations are the earthquake waves radiating out after a big event. So again, here's a great photograph of a roadway. All right, people in California, as crazy as they are, they're not so crazy as to build a road like this. This is an earthquake. This is a fault. And this whole plate moved this way relative to this. Another example of elastic rebound. Before the quake, as the pressure is building up, it breaks, it gives way, rupturing out, and then the resulting deformation. Elastic rebound, the theory that describes how pressure and energy build up and then ultimately are released. A couple of other quick terms, foreshocks and aftershocks. You've probably heard of these. Aftershocks, let's look, let's look at these. This is the settling or the adjustment of crustal rocks after a large earthquake. After you have a big event, uh, the tectonic plates need some time to kind of settle back into position and ultimately lock back into position and stick, and then they'll start building up pressure again over the course of 5, 10, 15 years. But these aftershocks can occur minutes, hours, days, months after the initial earthquake. And these can be very dangerous because if you have a building that was shaken by the initial quake and maybe it has significant damage but it didn't fall down, and then 30 minutes later you have an aftershock, maybe that building um, is going to fall during that aftershock. So it can be potentially very dangerous. A foreshock is similar. Small earthquakes small earthquakes that precede major ones, hence the prefix for, before, they precede major quakes by days or even possibly years. Some people have um, hypothesized that you can use foreshocks as a means to predict earthquakes. Now, the science on that isn't very, um, isn't very good. It's not necessarily a reliable way to do it, but scientists certainly still are trying to figure out ways to do that. Four shocks are basically, think about a tree branch or a stick. If you were to uh, take that small stick and, and put it in two hands and bend it, if you were to take this stick, <coughs> hold it in one hand, hold it in another hand, and then pull on this, pull on this, and you bend it and you bend it and slowly if you did it slow, you would start to hear cracks, the wood would begin to splinter, and then ultimately it would give way and it would break. All right. So those four shocks are basically when you're pulling on this stick or on this meter stick, those initial cracks, the, the initial splintering, it's the, it's the buildup of that um, strain and it's about to give way. Seismology. Um, is the term for the uh, branch of science, the branch of geology dedicated to studying earthquakes, earthquake waves, 
Uh, it's really been around for thousands of years, even in its basic form. The instrument used to measure and record seismic waves is called the seismograph, so make sure you keep that straight in your head. You have the seismograph, which is the instrument, seismology, which is the branch of science, and then the seismogram, which we'll learn about in a minute. That's the actual squiggle, the, the wiggling on the trace of the paper. Um, over 2,000 years ago, the Chinese made the very first seismograph, first scientific instrument used to record earthquakes. It is not what you would expect, and it's certainly not anything resembling a modern seismographs, which use the simple uh, concept of inertia and very sophisticated fancy springs. But the first seismograph was uh, something like this. You had a vase and you had these dragon heads attached to the vase and ever so delicately positioned inside the mouths of the dragons were these uh, metal balls. And you place this whole thing on a pedestal and if the ground shook, the vase itself would rattle and that would shake um, all the dragon's heads and the balls that were delicately positioned would drop out and they would fall down into the little froggy's mouths. So if you came back and you looked at these and there were balls that had fallen out of the dragons uh, into the frogs, you knew that an earthquake tremor had happened. Something had shaken the ground. So as I mentioned, modern seismographs incorporate the principle of inertia. If you remember what inertia is, that's Newton's first law of motion, which says that an object in motion will stay in motion, but similarly, it says that an object at rest will stay at rest. So the way modern seismographs works is you have a mass uh, attached to a spring, and then on the end of that mass there's um, a pin, and when the ground shakes, the mass holds still because of inertia, and then the ground shakes underneath it. Seismographs generally want to be placed in the ground at depth, away from city centers, away from train tracks, away from highways, away from anything that will cause a false reading uh, because of shaking. Seismographs always have three components. Seismographs measure have, have to measure in three, uh, three dimensions, excuse me, they always measure up, down, north, south, and east, west. Always measure in those three dimensions. Because depending upon where the earthquake comes from, you need to have a um, complete sense of where the waves originated from. And the only way to do that is with a seismograph that measures in three dimensions. So when seismographs record um, earthquake waves, earthquake activity, it uh, traces it onto a paper, and now they aren't as simple as that now. They're, they're computerized, and they use electromagnets and things like that, um, but the simplest, they still use the simple principle. So the data would be going along, and then when an earthquake happens, it would wiggle, and then ultimately would die out, and you would have some bigger shaking. Right? Time always progresses this way, along the horizontal. All right. Sometimes they flip these and you look at waves vertically, and we'll talk about that. But you can always measure the time that they occurred and how long they lasted. And also, we'll talk about the amplitude, how big the shaking is, the amount of energy that was released. These. So next set of notes, we'll uh, look at earthquake waves more uh, in depth and in detail. All right. So that concludes our first set of earthquake notes. Remember what earthquakes are, they are energy. Energy released um, inside the earth generally from tectonic motion. Remember what the focus is, contrast that to the epicenter. Know what faults are and how the energy propagates. Know who H.F. Reed was. <clears throat> know about stress and strain and ultimately how seismographs use inertia uh, to help us understand and measure the shaking due to earthquakes. All right, if you have any questions, come and talk to us. Good luck.